Like my worst fear is my life not having an impact on the planet. Dying and no one know that I exist is like the most terrifying thing to me. Me and my brother, we wanted new clothes. We wanted the latest trainers. Mm -hmm. My mum was just like, no. Like we're going on holiday. So you can't have those things. Instead, Mm, we're going to go on holiday. So for me, it was always like, okay, so you prioritise experiences over possessions. Yeah. And I think that's something that I've kind of carried with me. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur going into you. Everyone went to Big Four finance Mm -hmm. consultancy me and one of my friends were like no we don't want to do the corporate thing like Mm. we're young like let's live life i had absolutely no idea about anything business related like when it's your own 500 pound that you're putting in (laughs) and you're trying to like make this just grow and grow and grow and grow you get really creative like we've literally had companies rip out instagram bio and apply Mm. it to their page and Mm. like aggressively go after our customers you're not defined by where you, where you come from. Yeah. And I think that's a big message that I always yeah. want to tell people that. Like. like, you have to be able to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. When you grow up in ends, you don't realise it when you're confident, but you have an audacity to do things that ordinarily most people wouldn't be doing. Welcome back to the Takeoff Experience. We have a special guest in the building, Jamelia. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am good as well. So you were telling me offline that you had a very, very busy day today. I did. Yeah? What was you busy doing? I actually done two interviews. Okay. For two different positions this morning. Okay. And then online meetings and then like very boring admin office stuff like returning keys and <laughs> yeah getting electrical certificates for our old office yeah so boring stuff and then I was working on a pitch for a client that I'm really excited about okay is that is that the most exciting part of your day like doing the creative stuff and not the you know admin boring stuff do you, yeah. do you classify interviews as boring as well? no I like interviews okay. yeah I think it's really interesting to get to know people mm-hmm. And what I also think is so captivating is finding yeah. out people's perspective of the brand before they join right. it. So that's that was really, really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just so much really good talent out there. Yeah. So it's interesting to have various conversations, but mm-hmm. very difficult to make the decisions. And I guess for you as well, since you say that there's so much great talent, how do you, what do you do to convince them? Would you say? convince them yeah what do you mean so a lot i think these days right with i guess employers Mm. of course they've applied right but you Mm -hmm. also want to convince them that the culture's right and things like that so i guess what do you do to convince them that actually this is the right place for you to to work or do you think that they're already convinced (laughs) i mean i I don't i don't want to be cocky (laughs) but i don't think i don't think there's much convincing i feel i feel like if they applied for it, then they already are interested in what we're doing. Okay. Anyone that's applied and has been a really strong candidate has expressed that yeah. they understand the necessity of the business. Okay. They have an affinity to why we exist, the people yeah. that we serve, the mission that we're accomplishing and the impact that we're having on the industry. Okay. And so it's more of a like personality vibe check slash okay. match as opposed to like please be please join the company mm. it's like okay they appreciate what we're doing and equally we appreciate the skills that skills that they possess yeah and it's just figuring out like does this work on both sides yeah but i definitely understand what you mean because yeah. the job market is competitive on both it sides is, yes and yeah comp- um companies are going above and beyond but i think what you find with the companies that are going above and beyond and, mm. and are the really really big companies they just miss that thing that everyone really desires, which is yeah. like, how do I make an impact? How do I know that what I'm doing is worthwhile? Yeah. Am I working with people who are passionate about what they're doing? Mm-hmm. Am I working with intelligent people? Okay. Am I elevating my culture, which is what yeah. a lot of people care about now? Yeah. And I don't think that the big, big companies can actually compete with that. Okay. I mean, it sounds like you do a lot of convincing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, mean, I do look, it you kind of explained it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so who is Jamelia? Um, that's a great question. I would say Jamelia is a human being. Um, actually, first person that's ever said that. I think, yeah, in the seventy nine episodes that we have, yeah. Okay, a human being. Um, very creative, but equally quite sensitive. 
uh, very, very loving. I would consider myself to be generous. I mean, other people do say I'm generous. <laughs> um, I would say like family, friend and relationship focused. So okay. relationships mean a lot to me. Um, travel is like, almost at the center of my being like I okay. love exploring new territory new cultures love thinking of new ideas love anything creative really and yeah I like I'm very driven by purpose reason for existence and impact yeah and so I think that makes me someone that's like quite headstrong and quite driven professionally because I just like my worst fear is my life not having an impact on the planet okay. like dying and no one know that I exist is like the most terrifying thing to me really? so it's really really important that like okay. I feel like whatever I was put here to do I get as close to mm. it as possible if not surpass it mm. that's interesting mm. that is very interesting I want to ask you a few more questions about that why why would that bother you have you th have you thought about that why that would bother you yeah yeah Oh gosh, it's going to turn quite morbid. If I, <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I didn't know what you were yeah, going to say, but okay. I have thought about it a lot. Yeah, I have thought about it a lot for a number of different okay. reasons. Cool. One of the reasons is that I did lose one of my friends at quite a young age. Okay. Cool. And cool. when I thought about it, like mm. I've got such great memories of her. Okay. But if I was to Google her, like this is not to say that like if your life is not Googleable, then mm. it's not worthwhile. Yeah. But I just felt like she was such an amazing person mm. and I'm left with her impact. And I just wish more people could have felt her impact. Right. Okay. And so when I think about life, I just feel like how many people can I actually impact mm. and how many people yeah, can I leave an impression on like a mm. positive impression? How many people can I help? How many people can I touch? How many people can I serve? And so that makes me think a lot about like, I just can't take things for granted. Yeah. Like I actually absolutely have to be about whatever I'm doing mm. and I have to be driven by purpose and impact and service. Um, and I'm obsessed with Beyonce. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> one of her favorite, cool, one, cool. one of my favorite songs is okay. I Was Here because it really makes me feel like, yeah, yeah. man, like you really have to let the know that okay. world know that you were here and that yeah. like you're doing what you're doing. And for some people that looks like like massive global influence like Beyonce. And for other people, it's like a very humble cleaning job, but they're doing their best at it. Like the lady who helps us and cleans our house, mm. we have a great relationship with her. And like after she leaves, we feel we leave feeling like, oh my God, she's so lovely, man. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, when we move, we're really gonna miss her. And she's fulfilling her purpose in yeah. our lives because she's actually like she's being of service to us, but she's also just being such a good human. Yeah. And so I think it's important that like whatever your life looks like, it could look like you're a global dominating superstar mm. or you're like a very humble, I don't know, um, like house maker, like mm -hmm. whatever you do, I just feel like you should just be led by love and just pour into it in that way. Yeah. And I think things like that are really, really infectious. And I think that's important. Okay. Wow. That's admirable. Wow. <laughs> that's really good. That's really good. And I can see why that could lead into business, right? Which, mm -hmm. we'll, which we'll touch into, but I can see why that will lead into business in terms of what you're gonna be doing, which we'll, which we'll share a bit later. But going back into your story, where are your parents from? Both my parents are Jamaican. Mm -hmm. So they were both born here, yeah. but both schooled in Jamaica. Okay. And oh, then came back over here. Okay, interesting. And then my dad recently moved back. And he recently moved back. Mm -hmm. And were you born Jamaica? Here? No, no, I was born here. You you were born here? Yeah. Um, whereabouts did you mostly grow up? In, North in London, Edmonton. North London, Edmonton. Wow. Edmonton. What was it like growing up there? Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't lie. Don't lie. <laughs> no, it was cool. I lived in Edmonton until I was like 11. Okay. No, I think I was younger. I think I was like nine. Then we moved mm. to Enfield. Okay. Um, But it's fine. I have like fond memories. Yeah. Yeah. And did you school in the area, Enfield? Yeah. Edmonton so I actually well? went to school in, I went to primary school in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. While I was in primary school, my mum moved us to Atlanta for a year. So I went okay. to elementary school oh, cool. in Atlanta. Yeah. Then I came back to the same primary school. Then I went to mm. secondary school in Enfield, done sixth form in Enfield, then went to uni in Birmingham. Mm. Do you feel like that Atlanta experience might have sh got you interested in traveling? Do you think it did? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think my mum in general, to be honest, right. because yeah. I grew up in a single parent household mm. and like me and my brother, we wanted new clothes. We wanted the latest trainers. Mm -hmm. My mum was just like, no, like we're going yeah. on holiday. 
So you can't have those things. Instead, mm, we're going to go on holiday. So okay. for me, it was always like, okay, so you prioritize experiences over possessions. Yeah. And I think that's something that I've kind of carried with me. Right. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I'm absolutely the girl that was in uni or even before uni, like working mm. a job just so I could save, just so I could travel. Right, it wasn't ever like, okay. let me work and save so I can buy something. It was always yeah. like, let me work so I can save so that I can have this new experience. Mm -hmm. And those experiences, I feel, I, I, I'm one of those people. I, I definitely prioritize experience over material things. I feel like experiences are irreplaceable, to be honest. Mm -hmm. right? Like you can't, you can't just get, I don't know. It, it hits different for me anyway. I don't know about other people. I guess maybe people decide that actually they prefer, they prefer things. But for me, for sure, holidays, for sure. Mm. Okay. So, so, so you came back to, to North London. What, what was school like for you? Do you, do you feel like you were into, into, into your education? You weren't in, into your education? Yeah, I was. My mum's a teacher. Yeah. So like education was always top priority. Okay. Her mum was a teacher. So I literally come from like a lineage right. of women who were educated. Yeah. Um, so that was always top priority and naturally I found it quite easy. So it wasn't something that I had to try really hard really? at, okay. but equally I, w she, I'd done loads of activities. So I was playing mm. the violin, I was playing piano, I was doing dance. So I was doing like all of these other wow. things as well. And dance is something that I absolutely loved, mm. but then it got to a certain age where I felt like I had, I think it was sats and I felt like, okay, no, I need to put my head down and like really mm. focus on my academics. And I think that was kind of like a shift in or like a turning point for me, mm -hmm. um, whereby I just, yeah, really threw myself into education. Okay. Now that I look back, I wish that I had maintained a bit more of a balance because okay. I feel like that has become a habit for me that like, if, if I enter a season where it takes a lot of concentration, like I will go all in and have tunnel vision. Whereas I think I'm learning as I progress through adulthood that like that doesn't really work as much because you do mm. have other responsibilities that you yeah. need to manage. So, yeah. Interesting. Wow. That's interesting. And I guess, so you went to college, right? As yeah. Well? Went sixth form. Sixth form. And university, what subject do you decide to study at university? So university, I studied business and international relations. Okay. So whenever I say that, people are like, yeah, of course. But <laughs> I didn't take, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur yeah. going into uni. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I applied for a law degree at the university that I went to. But I studied the IB instead of A-levels, okay. which was seven subjects instead of four. One of them had to be a language. And when my results came out, I got two points less than I needed to study law, which meant that I didn't qualify for mm. the course. And I was absolutely gutted. Mm -hmm. Thought my life was over. Thought that like, no, my career dreams. It's crazy when you look back at your life is never over. Right? Ever. I felt like my career dreams like just mm. completely shattered. Um, but clearly it all worked out for my greater good. Um, so I studied business and international relations. Yeah. Particularly like that course because of the international relations aspect. It meant that I could travel and it was a requirement that I took a year out of uni to do a placement year. And mm -hmm. that was like one of the biggest turning points in my life again, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Okay. So you decided to do business and international relations because the law thing. Did you did you plan to go back down the legal route at any point? Or was it like, okay, law, that's it, it's done. I'm not I'm not going back there. No. <laughs> it, it wasn't a consideration for me because really? I, like, I didn't want to delay going to uni another okay. year because I had set in my mind that I was going to graduate by a certain age. Yeah. So what? then, really, what was that? What was the age that you were saying that you were going to graduate by? I, I think it will come out more as we talk. <laughs> <laughs> I can be a little bit extreme. So I was like, I have to graduate by twenty one. Okay. Because I had like this massive plan that by twenty five yeah. I was going to be married with kids okay. and high flying in my career. Obviously, that's not exactly how it goes. Why is everybody's? I'm trying to figure that out. Why is why, why was that your goal, actually? Yeah. Be good to discover. My goal to be married yeah. with kids and high flying in my yeah, career. Yeah, and finish uni at 21. Because like... I thought 25 was big people ages. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that at 25, crazy, right? you was a grown woman. Yeah, it's Which not... you are in a certain respect, but kind not of, really. It's still bit, so young. Yeah. So, yeah, I had big dreams, which meant I didn't have time to do a degree yeah. and then start yeah. the, the whole training program mm. for law. So I was like, okay, it seems like I'm doing business and international relations. Let me just mm -hmm. make the most of this degree and figure it out as I go along. Like yeah. I didn't start it thinking, okay, after this I'll do law. Um, I think a part of me was like, mm, maybe I'll do inter maybe I'll do business law after mm. or I'll do international law after. But no, I was like, let me just do this degree, mm. make the most of it, get as many experiences as possible so mm. that when I do decide what I want to do, I can make an informed decision yeah. rather than choosing a career before I've even 
like got my feet wet. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm wondering as we're having this con- conversation, because t- to set yourself goals like that, 21, 25, you're clearly, you're very driven from a young age. So I mm. guess where did that kind of drive for excellence, I, I would say, come from? I don't know. I I think it is definitely like a nature versus nurture thing. Okay. But my mum always said that like I was the most headstrong child that she has seen. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> like I think at like four, I was playing outside. I didn't know how to ride a bike and I would not stop until I taught myself how to ride a bike. Really? And she was like, Jamila, okay. you taught yourself how to ride a bike. Children don't do that. Usually they have a had adult helping them. But I was like, no, I need to figure this out. Mm. So yeah, I, I think I've kind of always been very, very determined. But equally... I think my parents had high expectations for me okay. and equipped me with all of the tools I could have asked for. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I kind of felt like it was my duty mm. to at least give them a good return on investment. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel pressure at any point in all of this, I guess? Do you think? Do you feel Self-inflicted, like, or... not by yeah. my parents. Okay, I don't feel like my parents put pressure on me. Yeah. I feel like I had a very good balance because yeah. my mum was like, a teacher all about education all about life experiences Mm. you never stop learning and my dad is like super chill bus driver very down to earth Mm -hmm. like jam just do whatever makes you happy so I had like the two extremes yeah Yeah, which left me quite balanced I think I think that's the best and you know I think as I grow older uh, I'm not sure if you might have had this realization you realize that actually the best environment, I'm, I'm not a father yet, but mm. what I would ideally like to do, the best type of environment is to allow your child to become just the best version of them and whatever they kind of mm-hmm. want to do. Obviously, just like, I guess you give them a few options. Okay, okay, maybe if you want to go into music, if that doesn't go well, just make sure that you have some sort of skills mm-hmm. to, to back it up so you can do something else. Yeah. I think that's the kind of environment that you kind of want to do. You don't want to limit them and say okay you must be a doctor you must be an engineer and they do something that they kind of hate yeah in a way right yeah um yeah you kind of want to just get them to be the best version and then they kind of figure out what yeah and like just nurture again i'm yet to be a mother yeah but nurturing innate interests like i was interested in dance from a really young age so i done ballet i done street dance done jazz I w- to be honest, I was not interested in instruments, so I was definitely <laughs> okay. forced down that path. <laughs> but um, yeah, like my interests were actually nurtured mm. and I was put in, I think I was put in environments that required me to grow, yeah. which were very uncomfortable at times, but mm. equally, yeah, definitely helped me build character. That's amazing. Okay, so ended up finishing uni, got your first job. Where was the Where was the first job at? Um, so my uni journey was actually quite interesting. Yep. I'm going to rewind a little bit. Okay. So in that placement year, mm. uh, everyone went to big four finance mm-hmm. consultancy. Uh, me and one of my friends were like, no, we don't want to do the corporate thing. Like mm. we're young, like let's live life. Let's have, let's have new experiences. <laughs> so we right decided, to do it. <laughs> right? Honestly, yeah. So we were like, we really want to go to New York. I don't know what it was about New York, but I was like, I have to go there and mm. I have to go there during this time. So first I went to Beijing for a month to do a marketing PR internship, which was a great experience. Um, Ran out of hair products while I was there, which was an absolute (laughs) nightmare. And Did it have no backups out there? I had to buy herbal essences, (laughs) conditioner, and some cheap gel, and I had to buy a shoe brush. Wow. It was tragic. I don't actually have any pictures from that trip. And then after that, I went to New York, which was like the complete other end of the spectrum. Mm. I remember the first time I went in Target, I was like, what? Like, there's this many products for black women. Mm. And there's brands that are owned by black women. Okay. Mad to me. Yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, something's not right here because Mm -hmm. we don't have these options in the UK. And so during that year in New York, I'd done entertainment PR, internship. I'd done fashion PR. And yeah, I think that was actually it. Yeah, I worked um, for a fashion agency and yeah. then I worked for a guy called BJ Coleman who was like in the entertainment scene, mm-hmm. which was really cool. And wow. I think I even done like a short stint at French Connection as well. Wow, yeah. that's so interesting. So, you, so you're so you building up these relationships mm. whilst you were out there. Were, was there any plan to stay out in New York or were you always thinking you were going to come back to London? 
I mean, American visas are not a joke, yeah, so I had not. no choice but to come back. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just sent you packing, yeah? Oh they God. will send you back in and not allow you back. So I definitely wanted to stay, but I had no choice but to come back. So I came back to London yeah. and I was like, do you know what? I've been interning for a year for free. Okay. I need to earn some money. That's amazing, though, that you did that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I was like, which industry pays good money? Finance. Mm. So I was like, cool, let me go finance. Mm. So I went to, I worked in financial services for three months. Then they invited me back as, they offered me the grad scheme during that time. Yeah. So I came back as a grad once I um had graduated and then I was on the grad rotation for three years. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. And a lot of life experiences in all of that, but mm. you saw it as kind of like fun, but clearly you're, you know, you're kind of prepping yourself to you know, as we as as we move forward, right, into into business. I guess Treasure Trash, why did you decide to create it or start it? What was the motivation? Um, so your first sorry, your first point about the experiences, for mm. me, I was at that time I was just thinking about like how do I build an attractive C V as a graduate? Okay. Because I went to a business school, all they drum into your head is that it's so competitive. Mm. Like you have to get a first. Yeah. If you don't get a first, and and then they'll say, well, everyone's getting first now. So what are you going to do to stand out? Mm. And I already knew that I was a black female, so I already knew that the odds were already against mm-hmm. me. So I actually remember going to see one of the lecturers, and I was like, look, I need to graduate with a first. And he was like, Jamelia, I'm going to be honest with you, black and Asian girls don't graduate with a first. And I was like, okay, cool, watch me. So I graduated with a first. Wow. And then I, um, but during, even during that time, I knew that just having that qualification wasn't going to be enough. So I was like, how do I enrich myself with experiences so that when I go to interviews, I've got something to talk about. Um, So that was like my driving force throughout those experiences. And then Treasure Tress was like that New York experience, that Beijing experience for me was like, why as black women can we not just travel freely and have readily available the things that we need to take care of ourselves. Because at the root of it, hair care is hygiene. Mm -hmm. Like why don't we have hygiene products that cater to us in the same way that everyone else does? And especially US, UK, I was like, why does the UK have to be 10 years behind? Why does it take 10 years for a product that's available in the US to become available in the UK? What is that about? I've learned a lot now about compliancy and all those things that hold Mm -hmm. it up. But yet still, it's, it just seems like things were just taking far too long. Mm-hmm. So for me, I was in love with the subscription model that I noticed when I was in the US. And I was like, there's nothing like it in the UK yet. Mm-hmm. I would love to start it. And I know that I would benefit from it because I'm someone that spends a lot of yeah. money on beauty. So yeah, I can save myself some money. <laughs> 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 so when you initially start, in fact, before I even go to that question, we're talking as if everybody knows what is Treasure Trust from your point of view? I know what it is, but mm-hmm. if you can just explain. So Treasure Trust yeah. is a product discovery service mm-hmm. for black and multicultural women. Mm-hmm. So essentially we send you new yeah. products directly to your doorstep every yeah. month. Yeah. So your full wash day lineup from a shampoo, conditioner, leave-in conditioner, oil, gel, everything you need to take care of your hair. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And it's a subscription, right? It's so a people subscription. Can, people, so I've seen you've got monthly, you've got bi-monthly. Mm-hmm. So, and then there's other options as well. Yeah. Um, so people subscribe and then you send out these products exactly. to them monthly by monthly other options. Yeah. So before you launched, did you, ha- I guess, what was a pre-launch phase for you? Like in terms of testing the types of products that you were going to include um, in your subscription boxes? Yeah. So I was already spending a lot of money mm. every month on products. I was, li- well, even while I was at uni, I was spending like £80 a month buying oh, wow. products on Amazon. Because I was seeing these girls use these products on YouTube mm. And there were all of these black American girls with like such long, luscious and full hair. And I wanted to use what they were using because I felt like my hair was really stagnant. Mm -hmm. But all of the things that they were using weren't available in the UK. So I was spending like £80 a month importing products, paying customs, clearance, clearance, whatever, um, fees so that I could actually get the products. And... Yeah, so I really had a I had a really good idea of the products that were on the market because okay. I had tried so many products myself and I was absolutely obsessed with hair and well I am absolutely obsessed with hair wow. and beauty. So I was spending a lot of time on YouTube watching other people's reviews, watching other people's response videos. Yeah. And so it was quite natural for me to know like which brands I wanted to target and which products I wanted to go after. Okay. 
But I think the beauty of Treasure Trust as a subscription is that we're able to help brands launch. Okay. So as a subscriber, you're able to get exclusive products yeah. that aren't yet available in the market, especially not for the price that the subscription is offered for. Yeah. And so I was able to find like this nice point where like this nice middle ground between the products that I already knew that really worked mm -hmm. and brands that I knew and trusted mm. that had new products in the market and they wanted to introduce it to the UK um to the UK audience. That's so interesting. So you you were literally your own guinea pig mm -hmm. uh, at the yeah. beginning, which makes sense, right? Like you, I feel you... like I still am to be honest. <laughs> Are you? Because <laughs> I get I get sent a lot of stuff and it's uh, like, hey, Jamini, what do you think about this? Okay. So. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I still am. Okay, so I I, I guess if we if, if we go down that route, right? Like, so somebody would have a new hair product, right? I mm -hmm. don't know. Let's say some sort of oil, right? They'll give you all this feel. It does this to your hair, and mm. you would you would test it, or you would get somebody to test it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then is that all it takes for them to? If it's if you like it and it's 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 good, is then you, would you start including it, or do you, do people have the option? Do you want this oil? Actually, we're switching it out um, this other one. So we actually have yeah. an activation once a year okay. called our pop-up shop. Oh. Uh, we done one in Birmingham called okay. Seven Girls. We were next to five guys okay. celebrating so cool. yeah. seven years of business. Yeah. The year before, we had a pop-up in London Bridge. Mm. The year before, we were online because of COVID. And then the year before that, we were in Shoreditch. And then our first one was in Peckham. Mm -hmm. Our subscribers are mm. able to choose what goes in their boxes, which is something that we've not done before That's all amazing. year round. So okay. now they can say, okay, I've tried that shampoo. I tried that conditioner. Okay. I tried that leave and I tried that oil. This is the box that I want to receive every mm. month or every other month. So that degree of personalization is what we're introducing now okay um but outside of that every month we choose what goes in the box so okay. we help you discover the latest and greatest and that's very much driven by the products that we have personally tried and tested yeah or the products that our trusted brand partners are releasing new to the market and we want our subscribers to try them first mm -hmm. yeah or like old time favorites that they've not seen in a while but we always love mm. to reintroduce back into our hair routine Wow, it sounds so fun. It is. This, wow, it sounds amazing. And I can see, you, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that you're quite a creative person. I can see how this leans into, mm. into that, right? And I can see how your creativity is is branching out into so many spaces. I never thought about the whole, the personalization makes complete sense, but I never mm. thought about the whole stall. So is the, is the stall, is having the stalls, is that to understand like if the products that you know these new brands are um, uh, um communicating with you mm -hmm. about is it to see if it's popular is that what what's that what's so that's about our pop-up shops are an opportunity for us to give mm. our customers first-hand advice okay so a lot of women oh. come in and they're like i don't know what to choose mm. and other women came come in and they're like i know exactly what i want okay. but it's just a right. chance for us to meet our customers in real life yeah. provide them with an in real life experience yeah and the whole experience is really, really important to us. Mm -hmm. So when we do pop-up shops, the first thing that I ever said when I was actually um, approached by someone who was interning with us yeah. about doing a pop-up shop, I was like, we cannot have a pop-up shop that is just white walls and a rail of t-shirts. Mm. Like we have to do something that's really impactful. So every single year we have a different theme. Last year, the theme was fast food. Um, as I mentioned, we were next door to five guys. We were called seven girls okay. and we took the That's theme so all the way. So much so that Deliveroo and Uber Eats drivers mm. were coming into the shop and we were like, no, <laughs> there's no food like <laughs> next door. And other people were coming in and were like, oh my God, is this a dessert parlor by five guys? And we were like, no, but it's hair care products. <laughs> like here's some hair food. So, cool. um, so every year there has to be like a really captivating mm. concept. And we've done that primarily because when you think of the experience that black women have in store, when we're shopping for hair and beauty, it's never been pleasant. Yeah, It's always been the black hair shop experience, which is sales assistants who look nothing like you and know nothing about your hair care, dusty shelves, mm -hmm. old products, counterfeit products. Like it's just such an unwelcoming environment. We were like, how can we create the complete opposite? Yeah. Which is a super engaging, beautiful, Instagrammable, like you want to take pictures in there. You want to bring your friends yeah. down. And equally, you want to shop products. And I think our favorite moments are when we see customers advising each other. There'll be like one customer that's like, I don't know what to choose. And another one will be like, oh, well, I tried this. And this yeah. is a product that you need to try. And this one and that one. Um, and I think in real life experiences are so, so crucial for e-commerce businesses because yeah. it really validates your products, your service. But it also allows you to pick up on language that your customers use that help inform how 
they perceive your brand. Yeah. So, for example, a customer telling another customer, I tried this through my treasure chest box and I really liked this because of X mm. is useful for us because whatever X is, that's what we need to do more of. Yeah. And equally, we might be talking to someone and they'll be like, oh, do you know what? I didn't like this in my box which is something that they wouldn't necessarily submit through an online survey. Mm. It's only in real life that you get that level of feedback. So I think pop-ups and in real life experiences are super important and crucial. I completely agree with you. And it's, it's admirable that you're doing that because I think a lot of people there, I, I can tell from, you know, from just what you said that you clearly care quite a lot about your customers. You And it goes back to what you were saying about the vision, right? Mm. And you wanting to make make a difference you clearly are passionate about that but you also care about your customers which is why you know things like a pop-up store is true you're, mm-hmm. you're right I, I think it's so weird like it's it, it hits different when you're in person yeah it, it's just different it's just a different vibe and it also humanizes Definitely. the people behind the brand right it's not just the brand <laughs> like, yeah you know, it's just that i'm just buying from a computer yes you are but like you're actually you're humanizing it Yes, it is actually a black woman that is behind this business. Literally, so (laughs) many of the women that come in are like, oh my God, wow, I can't believe that like the team's so young and I can't believe that it's all black women. Like, I can't believe that you guys are doing this at such a great level. And I think that level of representation is really important because the narrative of black business historically Mm -hmm. has been like super negative. But I think what we're seeing now is a complete revolution and renaissance of black business where like we are absolutely absolutely levels like yeah. we have raised the stakes we have raised everyone's expectations and we really deliver services that are worth paying for and products that are worth paying for yeah. and for people of all ages to come into our spaces and be like wow like first of all i'm so proud of you second of all i'm so happy to spend my money with you yeah. and third of all this is absolutely like mind blowing that's that's really really affirming and really rewarding so you decided uh, to go with the subscription yeah model I guess talk a bit about some of the benefits of going down that route as opposed to like, you know, some some businesses out there just do like a one time, one time thing. Yeah. Subscription model. I think it's quite a sexy business model. Like recurring revenue is always a win. Yeah. I think you get to know your customers really, really well. Uh, Lifetime value of a customer is a lot longer than if if it was just a one off purchase. Um. I think it's like the predictability of it. Like, you know, the cycle, the one thing that you really need to manage is churn. Okay. I think the cons of it is that with all of that upside, there is a really strong responsibility to maintain the relationship with that customer. Yeah. So when I talk about subscription businesses, I always say that it's like a relationship. Like you don't just take someone out on a date once and then expect them to text you every single day. Like that's actually not how it goes. You mm. have to take people out on dates. You have to get spontaneous. You have to keep them engaged, which yeah. means you have to maintain your community. You have to maintain that customer base. You have to keep them educated, informed, educated. I said that twice. <laughs> you have to keep them informed and educated. Double twice, right? <laughs> engaged. <laughs> Make sure you don't you educate them. Um, but yeah, it's, you put in a lot of work mm. to acquire the customer. But once you've got them into your ecosystem they're really, really valuable. Yeah. Because once they've subscribed, even if they leave your subscription, the chances of them coming back and buying from your store again or like being involved in the ecosystem of your brand through your experiences, your events is really, really high. Yeah. So in my mind, any business that I were to build going forward would definitely be a membership subscription model. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Many people are trying to do that now. I guess, how did you build that? How did you build that trust and how do you build up your membership? Trust, I feel like, was built by over-delivering. Okay. Like, that's something yeah. that I've said to my team from day one. Like, we under-promise and we over-deliver. Uh, for instance, the boxes are only £25, we've sent out boxes that are worth like 150 pounds, 90 pounds, 80 pounds. Like we go in to make sure that the boxes are exceptional value. Mm. And I think that that's really, really crucial. Yeah, Trust, I think consistency comes with trust, right? As in any, as with any relationship. Yeah, Like the more consistent you are, the more the person decides to trust you. I think having the visibility of who's behind the brand and the mm-hmm. team behind the brand for our pop-up experiences definitely helps build trust. Yeah. So events were really, really crucial to building that trust. 
And then there's a second part of your question. I can't remember. It was um, building up uh, the subscription. Because obviously yeah. building up a subscription, right, is like you said, it's like a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're committing, right? So how did you build build that commitment from your from your side? How did you build up your, your members? I would like it to sound more strategic than it was. <laughs> Look, because... we like the honest <laughs> and the truth. That's what we like on the podcast. Treasure Chest is my first business. Yeah. So I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. But I did know what I was seeking through the service. Mm -hmm. And I listen a lot to my customers, even yeah. to this day. Okay. Like if someone leaves a review and it's not a shining review, I want to talk with them. Like okay. I want to know what happened. Where did we go wrong? How can we improve? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty much the way that we've always been. Mm. And so we grew organically through events okay. and through word of mouth and through influencers who were open to us gifting them the boxes right. and were sharing it with their networks. Okay. Amazing. And <laughs> and you said something key that I think a lot of um, entrepreneurs should pay heed to taking feedback on board, taking mm. criticism, taking negativity. Was that, I don't want to say easy, was that, I guess, were you receptive to it f straight away? Or did it did it take a bit of time for you to learn, actually, no, for my business to be sustainable, for me to grow, I need to be able to take this on board? Oh, from day one, I took it on board. Okay, cool. Like, Amazing. when you start yeah. a business <laughs> with your own money, yeah. with no investment, yeah. your customers are your investors. Yeah. So there's no ego. Love it. And... I was literally <laughs> pitching to brands, packing boxes, taking them to the post office. There was no room for ego. So anything anyone said, literally, at the beginning, it really burnt. Like mm. if someone left, like, like sent an email that wasn't too nice or like wasn't impressed with a product, even though I didn't make the product myself, <laughs> I, I really took it to heart. Mm. So I think the one change that I've made is that I don't take it to heart. I'm like, okay, cool take it on the chin, make the change. Whereas before I used to like get quite upset and make yeah. the change anyway, but I would take it quite personal. But I've learned quite quickly that it's, it's actually not personal. They're mm. just giving their feedback. Don't get me wrong. The way some people deliver feedback <laughs> can be interesting. It can be harsh, yeah. 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 But I think ultimately there's nothing to be gained by ignoring feedback. Mm -hmm. Like if the person's rude, just cut through the rudeness and just get to the main point. Yeah. And whatever that point is, like do something with it. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. Do you do the postage and packaging yourself? Did no. you do? No, no, you no, don't. No. <laughs> the way you just said no, you said it. I didn't even finish the question. And you were like, no, we ain't doing that right now. No. no, sorry. Oh my God. Okay, so how do, how does that work? Is that outsourced then? Absolutely. That's absolutely outsourced. Mm -hmm. At what point At one did point you we did. Well, yeah. yeah, we kept it in house for a really long time. Okay. We kept it in house till like year five. Right, okay. Um, And we went through a few different iterations of what that looks like. Like, mm began in my mum's front room then mm. my mum's garage and then my mum was like get out <laughs> so then <laughs> it a my yard. we were operating from storage units that's where yeah. we were like packing our uh, boxes having royal mm. mail come and deliver it from, collect it from there then we moved to an office space that was large enough to have a warehouse in the house so we done everything there but that was quite challenging um and so we made the decision to finally um partner with a fulfillment service why why mm. Because um, I'm trying to paint the picture for for people, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's tough, right? When yeah. there's an office and you're speaking mm. to a brand, and equally you've got the team that are packing the boxes who want like packing boxes is quite monotonous, mm. so you want to keep yourself entertained. Yeah, and yeah, if you're young and you want to keep yourself entertained, you want to play music, mm -hmm. you want to key key. But when there's a client on the phone, they don't need to hear that in the background. Okay. I get it. And yeah. equally we our team was really really young our warehouse team was really young mm. which meant that we had to stay quite close to them on the day to day mm. but when you think about your list of priorities like there just wasn't capacity to mm. stay on the warehouse team yeah. and facilitate the office team to help them do what they needed yeah. to do and so yeah it was a matter of thinking how, how do we move more efficiently mm. and with a little bit more intention and that looks like dividing the two and having yeah focusing my energy on the office team so that we can grow the business yeah i get that i completely get that like you said it's so it's so interesting because the packing of the 
the boxes it's not that it's a low value activity it's not because that needs to be done correctly because mm-hmm. if it's not done correctly customers will complain mm-hmm. but it's like you said it's mundane mm-hmm. but it's important it's yeah. important it is very it, it, i know what people are like everybody's like that if you open a box or if it's crumpled or whatever mm-hmm. it's like what they'll complain absolutely you know even if the product itself is it is fine the box isn't chris mm-hmm Mm -mm. so yeah i do i do completely get that and i i guess working with you know a company that's doing the fulfillment for you Mm -hmm. are there certain standards that they've of i'm assuming that they've promised you certain standards that Mm -hmm. they will live up to do you have to do quality checks or do you you just kind of leave them to it and then until something you have to do quality checks so we receive boxes in the same way that our customers do so we can get a good feel of okay so this is how the customer received the box but equally our customers share their unboxings online so we can see people opening their boxes and i'm like "Mm, that product does not look right or like i don't like the way that that's been so we can stay quite close to it that way thankfully through social media but I feel like anything you've there's pros and cons of everything like yeah. having it in-house isn't perfect but outsourcing mm. it also isn't perfect yeah yeah it sounds like you're saving a lot of time though mm-hmm. on that right mm-hmm. um and then you're, you're you're gaining efficiency right so I guess how does that work is it that you yeah you tell me how it works I don't want to zoom how mm. it works how, how does that so if I was a customer and I I said okay I want to you know get a monthly subscription mm-hmm. um obviously you you guys will have my details is yeah. it then you just then send in the details or is it just going directly to the fulfillment directly okay oh, so okay. as soon as we get the order they get the oh, order oh, um like but that. we do run in cycles okay. so the date that you subscribe will dictate the box that you get ah okay okay mm-hmm. cool, cool cool so it's based on a cycle okay that's cool yeah how much did you put into the business at the start i feel like i put in Anywhere between five hundred pounds and wow. one thousand five hundred. Really? Yeah. Did that did that burn you when you did that, or did you say, "Oh, this is a little investment at the time"? Um, five hundred pounds weren't no little investment at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but now you're probably thinking, "Yeah, come on, man, that's that's yeah. nothing." But I know at the time, probably were thinking, "Oh, should I? You, is it a risk?" I, again, I'd never done it before, right? Yeah. So I, I didn't know what was going to yeah. be the outcome. Yeah. Yeah, there's. I could have done a lot of other things with that money. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess it, yeah, it did at the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and what is the outcome? What What has been the outcome? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to give me, you know, because I know some people, to be honest, don't want to talk about figures all the time. But yeah, I guess what? Yeah, if you could give us a sense of it. I mean, it's the best investment I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> To say that you it's can basically best... get the 500 however many times right yeah definitely <laughs> multiplied that <laughs> yeah um yeah yeah okay i was wondering as you were talking about the hair products and your love for hair products i guess why did you decide to partner instead of creating your your own, mm. own products for me i decided to partner with brands and work as a marketing channel for brands as opposed to manufacture our own because the issue that i was solving wasn't that there weren't enough black hair products on the market it's yeah. just that we didn't have access to them mm. and that we didn't have the education okay. in addition to the product yeah so for me the solution wasn't going to be creating my own range of products the solution was going to be educating everyone on the products that are already available in the market so that they know how to use them okay cool love it and i think you know it's so interesting because amazon doesn't well now yeah now they do but when they started they didn't Mm. create their own products right i think everybody's always in love with creating products Mm. as a business i don't think you need to to have a viable business right i agree you know you can kind of it's almost like a bit of a hack Mm. to be able to use somebody else's product and then still create value out of it Mm -hmm. right and as you mentioned as well there's a lot of um there's a lot of brands out there that have not been discovered and people Mm -hmm. don't want to take the risk when they when they associate with your brand Mm. which they trust Mm. then they oh actually treasure trust has done that for us right yeah we can now trust trust that this 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 now works I guess my question that I had for you, are you worried about imitators? 
anybody imitating your business or is it like no we've got our goals we've got our vision we're just gonna do what we're gonna do or you haven't even thought about that i mean professional jamelia would say no but don't get me wrong it's annoying yeah if someone like like we've literally had companies rip our Instagram bio and apply yeah. it to their page and like mm. aggressively go after our customers. Seriously. So that is very annoying. Let okay. me not pretend. So wait, this has happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I've got many stories, trust me. Oh, okay. So yeah, wow. that's that's been very annoying. But ultimately, I'm very competitive. Yeah. So I would just want, it It, it spurs me to just deliver a better service mm -hmm. and then let the best man win, really. Yeah. Mm. <sighs> I, you know, my take on the whole imitator stuff, I just think that long term it's not going to work. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it validates think, the yeah. idea, it validates the market. Yeah. But ultimately, yeah, no one ever gets ahead by following exactly what someone does. Because how far can you follow? Yeah. Right? Like now you've now said, okay, you're going to do, you know, um, allow customers to customize. They might not fall about mm -hmm. that. They can't just copy every single mm -hmm. step. So it's like, where does it stop? Do you? I mean, yeah. you might have another completely different idea that you want to yeah. do, right? And that's that's your innovation at the end of the day, right? Mm. I don't think that's the thing. That's why I say I, it's it's short term. It's not going to yeah. work, right? Because I just don't think unless if 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 it's not your vision, you can't see. You can see it, mm -hmm. but they can't see. It. Yeah, they might copy the the output. Of yeah. some stuff but they're not gonna all be able to see where you're trying to get to yeah you know what i mean cool as an entrepreneur why do you think you found success um i don't I, first of all i think success is so relative mm -hmm. and i don't honestly feel like i'm in a position where i feel like yeah like i'm successful mm. because the goalpost always moves like if if this was me when I first started Treasure Trust, I would think, oh my days. But now mm -hmm. I've got so much experience, the goalpost keeps moving. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that my journey has been successful based on how much I've learned and how much impact I've had on the industry. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that has been determined by, I think, connection. Okay. I think one thing that I've always leveraged and prioritized is connection to our customers yeah. and connection to and customers and clients alike. So the connections that we have with the brands that we work with and the connections that we have with our subscribers, mm -hmm. the connections with the wider community, like yeah. talent, influencers, um, key figures. I think it's all it all comes down to connection. Yeah. And I think that that has been the most important thing. And the fact that it's very authentic yeah. like I literally created a brand that I really wish existed yeah and so a lot of the things that we do is led by our gut and led by intuition because it's led by what we want to see yeah. and I think that that's that's really important yeah yeah I completely agree I completely agree so you've been doing this for seven years as a long time mm -hmm. first business I'll tell you offline that it's like it's basically you're like a unicorn really not not many people <laughs> <laughs> look you're humble that's why you're like oh no i don't know but um i guess in your seven years what would you say have been some of the challenges that you found as an entrepreneur wow where do we start mm. challenges I feel like everything's double-sided. One of yeah. one of the challenges I was going to say is naive, naivety. Like I just didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And when I say I didn't know what I was doing, I was unaware that people were out raising money for businesses that were a piece of paper. I thought that I had to create my business, prove it for a year, then go out for funding. So I had right. absolutely no idea about anything business related. Okay. And so I think I was really naive, but then equally, I think that naivety paid off because it made me really creative. Like when it's your own 500 pound that you're putting in <laughs> and you're trying to like make this just grow and yeah. grow and grow and grow, you get really creative. And I think that those sparks of creativity have carried the brand a very long way. And a word that always comes up when people describe Treasure Trust is innovation. Mm. And that has come out of necessity. Yeah. So I think naivety was definitely a big thing challenges i think even connected to that point when i did start to speak to investors the take was very much like oh uh it's a very niche business yeah. why don't you consider widening 
broadening your scope, mm. including white women. Like, why doesn't your box also mm. cater to women with straight hair? Mm. And I thought, oh, no, like, that's actually not, it. mm, it's yeah. not really the problem I'm trying to solve, if I'm yeah. being honest. So that fundraising challenges so did you get did you did you no. overcome the fundraising no no so we've bootstrapped up into this point. really yeah yeah yeah. we've not taken incredible get over. wow thanks wow. um so th- this is what's so interesting right mm. so you bootstrapped and if you what is likely maybe you can tell me if this is happening probably what's going to happen is investors will now come and say oh look what you've done seven years mm. da, da, da. and now they'd be interested which is it's kind of messed off, isn't it? Yeah. In a way, right? But equally, I get it yeah. because yeah. for this market, it was a new concept. Yeah. And yeah. for this market, like, black, like, they weren't selling black hair products in high street stores in the way that they do now when we launched Treasure Dress. Yeah. And, I mean... That's very say, true. Yeah. That is very true. Yeah. I can definitely account for that. And the work that we've done yeah. has been very, very influential in that. Yeah. So... I get it because it was new and everyone's scared to be the first mover, right? Mm. So, but yeah, I guess now we've validated the idea and the market is growing. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That is so interesting. I did not realize that you bootstrap. How did you find that? I was going to ask you actually, um, it's actually related to to my next question was how do you deal with the, you know, the unpredictability Mm. with with being an entrepreneur? Because it is unpredictable, right? Obviously you started a career and then you know use your 500 pounds to start your business how, how how did you deal with with all that i think subscription the mm. model just helps okay. with that right because you know you you can you get the foresight yeah you know what the next cycle looks like okay. so you know what to expect yeah whereas i feel like if we were a storefront i mm. think it would be a very different story okay. so i think the predictability and the cyclical nature of subscription definitely yeah. helps with that okay wow great answer <laughs> <laughs> What aspect of the business keeps you up at night? (laughs) (laughs) Is it multiple things? It doesn't keep me up at night. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, a lot, a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot that happens. Like, I think there's a perception of treasure stress. And then once people actually get into the company, they're like, oh my days, there is actually so much going on. Yeah. So there's always like, client pitches there's always logistics like Mm. i cannot tell you how many times we have had products stuck at sea or we've had products stuck in the us and it's meant to be in the uk already or like there's just always something going on yeah but i think the hardest part of running a business i don't think is any of those things i think it's actually people management yeah Mm. yeah do you enjoy the people management yes and no okay i really really enjoy fostering talent and like pulling the best out of people Mm -hmm. but I find it really really difficult when yeah I I think because I'm so self-determined and Mm. so self-driven and it's my absolute desire to just show up the best I can yeah and that's that's not just because it's my business that's just the way I am like when I was working in retail I wanted to be the best sales assistant okay when I was doing admin I wanted to be the most efficient Mm. admin person and I find it really difficult if that sentiment is not matched yeah yeah that's so interesting actually because it's your business it's your baby Mm. so maybe it's not that they're not as passionate about it maybe they they are but Mm. but maybe their style of work is different and Mm. maybe the way they show it doesn't always come out right but that's i didn't even say that though yeah i I don't even want them to be as passionate about the business i think i want them to be as passionate about their self-development okay okay because some of the um times i found management really challenging is when i know that someone's really got it Mm. but they're just not like pulling it out themselves or like pushing themselves i find that really tough so i'm like why don't you want that Mm. whereas like the shining stars are the people that are like no like i'm showing up today for me yeah. like as much as i work at treasure Trust, mm. this is my game yeah. because i want to be the best version of me okay and that is what i love yeah that's so interesting because it's it's i don't want to say it's rare but mm. <laughs> <You're kinda wrong. laughs> sorry um <laughs> it's I, I would say it's as in you think it's rare that that people want to show up for themselves you think interesting I think huh. I think it's an age thing. Okay, yeah. Because I think yeah. now social media, in particular TikTok, 
quiet counseling counseling or quiet quitting sorry quiet quitting, yeah, is yeah. really a thing yeah yeah where yeah. people are like yeah. look yeah. i don't want to overwork i'm gonna do the bare minimum and get Which by is silly. and i think that that's really yeah. counter yeah. to the approach of i'm showing up today for myself yeah. because i want to become better at whatever yeah. i'm doing yeah so i would say that it's right in that respect but again I'm excited by, I think interviewing continues to make um, me excited because yeah. there is so much talent out there yeah. and the right people are really self-determined and yeah. are really like, yeah, I want to, I want to perform well in this company, mm. but I want to perform well for myself yeah. because I want to be the best fill in the gap. Yeah. As much as there are, you know, I know quiet quitting is like a buzzword. Like mm. you said, there are the same amount of people who are super motivated mm got to do the best they're going to give their best to to the business it's such an interesting thing because like you like you said when you when you're joining a company anyway really it is for yourself as much as it is for mm. the company it is for yourself you are developing yourself so i don't yeah. know why people don't see it like that yes you are getting paid yes there are other aspects but you are also developing yourself yeah is it true, but right? equally like while mm. there's the quiet quitting thing i think yeah. there's it also comes down to confidence sometimes yeah, yeah. Like sometimes people just don't have enough confidence to believe that they can perform at a certain level or deliver at a certain level. And then that confidence sometimes looks like withdrawal. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that that's also a factor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So take me five years, 10 years in future. I'm not asking you for your five, 10 year plan. I'm not asking for the vision. Mm. What, what, what do you see is like the next evolution for, for Treasure Trust? Mm. I think one of the areas that we've become quite obsessed with, but equally has made a real dent in the industry has been data and insights. Okay, yes. That's so important. 21, we released a white paper. 22, we released a trend report, the untapped oh. opportunity in the UK Afro hair market. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been on calls with big retailers and they've been reciting back to me my own stats. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. We're onto something here. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's appreciation of the black consumer is going to yeah. hit a whole nother level. Yeah. And I'm really excited for us to be at the forefront of that. Okay. Retail is like brick and motor is not dead at all. Like there's no, absolutely not, no. a place for it in the market. Yeah. Looking at what that looks like globally and continuing to build out our operations globally because they're not as global as they should be. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually ask you this. Are, is the do you ship worldwide or is it yeah just we do you do you do We've ship shipped worldwide. over yeah. 42 countries wow unintentionally <laughs> wow what what was i guess why did you decide to do that yeah. it was an accident okay when i built the store initially i mm. didn't realize that i had international shipping on and so <laughs> the first batch of boxes that went out there was an order from south africa oh. and i took it to the post office and i was like i don't know how to get this there but can you help me yeah <laughs> and she was like yeah you need to print this label but it's 15 pounds and i was like great <laughs> there goes my margin wow. um so yeah it was an accident and then ever since then we've added the right postage and packaging in mm. um so that we can facilitate people but i think yeah. it's just affirmation of the fact that black women are everywhere they like are everywhere. saudi arabia yes. abu yes. dhabi yes. japan korea like everywhere we have had orders wow. from and it just shows that black women wherever you are in the world you want your hair products delivered and yeah that's 100%. what we're here to do oh my god that's that's so funny that it's facts and it's mm. everything happens for me Literally, literally so i guess were you ever planning to to do like the us africa was it just okay i'm just gonna focus on uk no when i launched i just wanted to do the uk because right, i knew that okay. i was in the uk and i knew what the access uh, to products was like the us i was like they don't need us like they've got all of the products in the yeah. world but i would say year two our us customer base grew quite quickly wow which made me think i think i'm missing the value proposition mm it made me realize that the value proposition, while the products were attractive, that wasn't all that it was. Mm. It was the collective sense of sisterhood yeah. and the shared experience mm. of opening a box every month okay. and discovering beauty, discovering yeah. hair care, as opposed to going into a shop and mm. like taking the, getting the product that you always like. Yeah. It's like this adventure that the, that the service takes you on. Mm. And that made me think, okay, how do we lean into that more? Hence mm. the pop-up shops, hence the events that we do, hence the newsletters. Um, but yeah, at the beginning, it was UK only because mm. I was like, look, we're suffering, man. We ain't, we don't yeah. have what we need. Yeah. yeah. You know what I find amazing? You're so, like, 
a lot of introspection and I think that's mm. what's been I don't know if you agree but I feel like that's been really key for your business mm -hmm. and it's not that you've just said okay yes you started off with this is my idea but you've not just dictated it you're like actually how do you guys feel mm. about it what does it mean to you and then you're then feeding that back into it to make it like yeah. you said you're you're feeding it back into your value proposition because the truth of the matter is right when you start a business, yeah, you've got an idea, but it evolves, it changes, it, it morphs, evolves. right? As you get more feedback and and that's how it grows. That's how you stay relevant and mm -hmm. that's how you stay alive, right? Yeah. You know, if you have just said, okay, actually, no, I'm not going to even do the pop-ups. No, we're not going to do the customization. We're not going to do anything else. We're just going to, this is what I want. This is how we're going to mm. do. Maybe, do you know what I mean? It would have yeah. maybe not gone there, but you've you've gotten that feedback and you've you've changed um, as, it, as, as it goes. And I think that's a great way to do business yeah to be honest. i think yeah. that's the way it should be and i think it's definitely been a labor of love for myself but everyone that's ever been on the treasure yeah. trust team yeah. because everyone's brought like oh damn we should do this or oh maybe we should try this and i i, I mean they might they might <laughs> disagree <laughs> but i don't feel like i've ever completely shut yeah. down an idea i'm yeah. always quite receptive to mm -hmm. okay let's try it and let's see what yeah. happens if it works we repeat it if mm -hmm. it doesn't then then we don't and we crack yeah. on yeah wow that's amazing. Okay, so your experience, I know you'll be like, seven years is a lot of experience in business, yeah, right? Mm. So for, for entrepreneurs wanting to start a business in 2023, what is the one piece of advice that you would give to them? Change is a constant. Okay. <laughs> like change is absolutely a constant because in the last three years, we've gone through pandemic, mm -hmm. cost of living, like there is always something that's coming up. Yeah. Change is absolutely a constant and the most important person is your customer. Yeah. Don't let anyone tell you any different. Yeah, 100%. I completely agree with that. So what do you have planned next for yourself? Oh, for myself. Do you know what? I've actually, I haven't had a coach in a while. Mm. I haven't had a coach, I would say in about eight months. Okay. So now my conversation with myself is that like, yeah, I need... I need someone to help me get to the next level right? Okay. because I can read all of the books. I can le listen to all of the podcasts, but I really desire that accountability of like, yeah, someone really pushing me through. I've got great mentors and I've got a great network, but I feel like I want that person that's going to like make me do them burpees in business. <laughs> okay. okay, cool. Make me do that treadmill run that I don't want to do. Yeah. Make me lift those weights that I think I can't lift. Like mm. that's, that's what I really, really desire. I need to pick my podcast back up. Okay, cool. Uh, um, yeah, just, ex I guess, expansion, elevation, mm -hmm. and returning back to, like, the guiding light for me recently has been, like, my younger self because mm. I was a riot. Like, I was so self-determined. I was so confident. Yeah. Like, I would take up any space. So, like, okay. my guiding light right now is like, oh, what would little Jamelia do? Okay. And it's like, okay, what did she enjoy? How do I get back to those things? Mm. And how do I create my life around that rather mm. than focusing on anything else that the world tells me that I should prioritize? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy that as you say that, I feel like you mentioned you being naive before, right? When you first started. And I feel like when you're naive... <laughs> You, t you tend to probably take on more risks and then you do stuff and you don't really, you don't think about it. But then when you experience it, you kind of mm. limit yourself. It's weird. As yeah. you get more experience, you yeah. become more limited yeah. in your creativity because you've now got learned experience. You're like, mm -hmm. you're now like, okay, actually this didn't work out. So maybe I shouldn't try something that's similar to this. It's so, yeah. it's so interesting. As you get more experience, you're just yeah. not as, whereas where you are, you don't know. So you're like, oh, okay, let mm -hmm. me, <laughs> you yeah. know, you don't know what, what what's going to happen, what's going to go wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's it's definitely, it's definitely so interesting. It's um, like that journey of adulthood. Yeah. Like as an adult, <laughs> you become more fearful of things. Whereas mm. as a child, you just jump, like you don't care. Exactly, exactly. So where can people find you? Mostly on Instagram mm -hmm. at Jamelia is obsessed. Starting to get into TikTok at Jamelia is obsessed. TikTok is great. Um, and at Treasure Tress across all platforms, of course. And that's pretty much it. Amazing, amazing. Do you have any final words for the watchers and listeners? My final words would definitely be to measure your life success by your own metric 
instead of allowing the external world to determine it. Because I truly believe that everyone is here to do something. Yeah. And again, it looks completely different for everyone. But I think it's really important that we hone in on that. We learn to quiet the noise of everything else and do what we're here to do. And ultimately, that looks like constant revision of ourselves, redefinition of ourselves and like really pushing ourselves to the next level. And it takes great awareness. It takes great discipline, but equally enjoying the journey and having fun along the way is really important. Completely, completely, completely agree. And you're right. I think it's, it is tough because social media is there and mm. we're constantly comparing ourselves to our peers, to people that we don't know mm-hmm. and thinking that's the standard when actually really and truly don't even know people's lives. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, seeing somebody say oh they're doing well I also want to do well there's nothing Mm. wrong with that but then what I find wrong is if you're now judging yourself against them when they have their own goals when you should have your own goals I think I think it becomes a bit difficult difficult there and it's been great speaking to you today Um, yeah me too The, the it's I, again I'm not surprised why you have succeeded <laughs> not because you're headstrong mm. like you say I think you're you're determined you're driven um you're open to feedback I think that's super important I think that's probably the most single most important thing that's how mm. somebody grows honestly that's yeah. how somebody grows getting feedback and it's a it's the toughest thing because we all have an ego and I don't, I don't mean like a big big ego but we we all have that ego of ourselves and we don't want people to criticize us or criticize anything that we do because then we feel bad and Mm. and stuff like that when it's not always personal right sometimes Mm -hmm. it's professional Uh, and I think it is really really key in getting you to the next level and it's so exciting that you said that you got you got to get a coach right Mm because a a coach is going to be there to be like you can do this better you can do this but some people don't want to deal with that right yeah so you know and you 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 see that that's what's going to help you get to the to the next level so it's it's um it's super important so yeah no appreciate you coming on today watchers listeners appreciate you listening and watching to this episode and we'll see you next week's episode of take up experience <laughs>